Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you all and welcome you to Draminis. If you're visiting with us this morning, um, we want to welcome you and we trust you feel at home as you meet together with us for worship. If you're next door in the Red Room, um, again, shout out to the ones in there who are very friendly when I go for a walk through before church. Um, I'm glad you're in there and I hope you can participate with us in worship um, well and meaningfully next door. And to those who are watching later on um, or listening, it's good to have you gather with us as we meet for worship. A few things to highlight by way of announcements. First of all, that this afternoon at 3 p.m. we will have our first church membership class. As you're aware that over the last 18 months, it has been less easy and less possible to do things like that um, in smaller groups. But the opportunity now arises for us to do that again. So if there's anyone who would like to consider coming into full membership on profession of faith or on transfer from another congregation, um, I'm meeting with folks at three this afternoon in the Red Room. If there's a big, big crowd of us, then we'll move to a bigger room. Um, but we're meeting this afternoon at three in the Red Room. Anybody who would wish to consider coming into membership, either on profession of faith or transferring from another congregation. <clears throat> and then this evening is Evening Harvest at Red Rock at 7. Um, Graham Mullen, who served a placement with us a number of years ago and is now the minister in Moy and Ben Burb, Graham is going to be with us this evening at Red Rock at 7 pm. Can I encourage you to come across to that? Um, their choir have prepared music for Harvest Sunday, and they would love to invite you across to share with them in worship this evening at 7. This week, Wednesday night, Bible study is here. So our Wednesday evening series, our Bible study series, is here in Draminison on Wednesday night. You possibly have noticed from a fortnight ago, um, we've endeavored to record the, the content or the teaching content of Wednesday night so that you can follow up on that later on in the week. We'll try and do that again, but we'd encourage you to come along on Wednesday night for our Bible study and prayer time at 8 in the church hall, which also reminds me there are still about seven or eight copies of Love Your Church, which is a book that we're looking at this winter, both in our Bible study, but as a congregation. Um, I said to the folks and emphasized again in the week that has passed, the Lord loves his church. He gave himself for us. And so if the Lord values his people, his church, then how much more so should we consider what it means for us to love what he has given us as a gift to be part of his church. So can I encourage you, even if you're not coming along on a Wednesday night, there are copies of that book. They are sitting on the table in the foyer. And um, please lift one. They're only five pounds each. And at some stage, put five pounds in the box. Reminder that next Sunday, the time changes. We were having a chat at the back working out. It is an extra hour in bed. So if you turn up early next week and wonder why there's nobody about, and um, that'll be because the clocks have, have changed. They have fallen back. You get an extra hour in bed, um, and we're here for worship at the new, the new 10.30, um, whenever next weekend comes around. Can I also finally draw your attention to the announcement on the sheet regarding the old church building? Um, as you're probably aware, over the, the time that we were building this lovely building that we now meet in on a Sunday morning for worship, we talked at length about a timetable and an appropriate timetable with how we would deal with the old building. As it has deteriorated, it becomes a health and safety issue um, with tiles and with one or two other matters. And committee have unanimously decided that the best road ahead is to carefully take down the old building and then to mark the place where it stood in an appropriate way. So we're, we're thinking about that and how we would do that. There's an announcement regarding that on the sheet and committee will share more in the new year as to our road ahead. But we met and decided unanimously that after a decade in here, which is hard to believe, from September 2011 to now, October 2021, um, that the time had come um, to do that rather than just letting it go to, to waste in, in the sense of falling apart and looking untidy. And we felt that that was unanimously the right thing to do and made that decision on Tuesday night past. Those are all the announcements. Um, let's 
turn our mind away from announcements and to God's word as we gather for worship. In Psalm 135, the psalmist writes this. He says, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to his name, for that is pleasant. The Lord has chosen Jacob to be his own and Israel to be his treasured possession. I know that the Lord is great, that our Lord is greater than all gods. The Lord does whatever pleases him in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and in all their depths. And the psalmist contrasts our living God to any other idol or God that we might set up. And he says this, the idols of the nations are silver and gold. They're made by the hands of men. They have mouths, but they can't speak. Eyes, but they can't see. Ears, but they can't hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. How we thank God this morning that we come to worship a living God. The purpose of our gathering this morning is to worship him and meet with him. And it's incredible to realize that we, through Christ, are his treasured possession. So we're going to come and bring him the worship that he deserves. We're going to stand as we sing together, God of grace, amazing wonder, irresistible and free. We're going to stand, we're going to use our voices and sing to God's praise together. We're a people who are living on a journey. Um, here is home, um, not just Northern Ireland, but this world we live in. But to know Christ as Savior is to live anticipating a day that yet lies ahead where we will be in the Lord's presence in person. When we gather this morning in church, we can't see the Lord. We can't see him with our eyes. We hear his voice through his word. We gather in his presence for worship. But what we live and look towards is, in a day, is a day when we will see him face to face. And so even as we look ahead and anticipate that, let's come grateful that he is with us this morning by his spirit as we gather for worship. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, the richness of your word. And as the psalmist writes, he writes authoritatively of a God who is able to do as he pleases. And Lord, we don't take that lightly to read it this morning. That you are the living God, not like the idols, not like the man-made gods. You have eyes that see. You have ears that hear. Lord, thank you, thank you that you are the God who speaks 
that your living word speaks, that Christ was your final word. His life and death speaks to us this morning. Through your spirit, you speak. And so, Father, we realize the, the awesome privilege that it is today to come to church, to worship the Lord who is alive, who is great, who is good, and who does what he pleases. Father, forgive us when we've let this become a small thing, an insignificant thing, a take-it-or-leave-it thing. Lord, we beg your forgiveness and mercy for coming, belittling you in that way. And so, Lord, today we come once again grateful to hear your word reminding us that you have chosen us as you chose Jacob, that you call us your treasured possession as you called Israel. And so, Father, today, we thank you for the grace that we've sung of that you've shown us in Christ, that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Lord, I thank you for this place where, as we weekly open up your word, that you strive with our hearts. You call us again to faith and obedience. And so, Lord, wherever we're at today, whatever we've struggled with, wherever we have failed you, wherever seeds of doubt have crept in, Lord, we come afresh this morning, asking and praying that as we confess our sin openly and honestly, that you would forgive us. Lord, where we long for you to, to fill us up and refresh us, that you would do that through your word this morning. And Father, we pray that even in this hour this morning, you would equip us, that we would be useful instruments in your hands onto the day that Jesus comes back. So Lord, help us this morning, whether we're little, right through to the eldest as we gather. Father, we pray that we would worship you in a way that pleases you and that we would have our ears open to listen to the God who speaks, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to read together from God's Word, from Isaiah. We're continuing on in Isaiah, and this morning we're reading from Isaiah chapter 12, one of the shorter chapters in Isaiah, and it's called our Songs of Praise, or a Song of Praise. It ties in very much with chapter 11, but we're going to be thinking a bit about all the references that point ahead to Christ. We're going to be thinking about that um, in the weeks that lead up to Christmas, but I want to turn our attention this morning um, in chapter 12 to this song that Isaiah leads the people in regarding God and his provision for them. So this is God's word from Isaiah chapter 12. In that day, you will say, I will praise you, O Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With you, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion. For great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Amen. And we thank God for his living word. Now, boys and girls, I need your help again this morning. In a minute or two, there'll be a, a picture comes up on the screen, but we'll leave it for a little minute. I've brought something to church this morning. I want to show it to you. Now, what do you think, first of all, what is it? Anybody know? Yeah. Yes? What did you say? Yeah. String? Well, it's, I hope it's a bit stronger than string. Do you know what you call really thick, strong string? Yep. Rope. Brilliant. Yeah, you call it rope. Now, the question is, why have I brought rope to church this morning? Anybody get any ideas? Do you have an idea? Yeah. 
you know, I was just about to say that somebody's going to suggest they've heard my little black Corsa and they've heard the noise that it makes as it rips around and they're going to say, Sam, very soon you're going to need your car towed. But I didn't bring it to church. That's a really, really good suggestion. But that's not why I brought my rope to church this morning. Anybody else got a better idea? Okay, I'm going to show you. I'll give you another clue. It involves this. <laughs> what, what, what's that? Yep, Jensen? Bucket. A bucket. Absolutely, that is a bucket. Now, if I told you this morning that I've got a rope and a bucket and I'm a bit thirsty, has anybody got an idea what I might be up to? Any of the older people might have an idea. If you were thirsty and you had a bucket, where might you go? Abigail. A well, yeah. So um, let me see what we can do here. Woohoo! It nearly went flying. It would help if the bucket had a whole handle, wouldn't it? And you lower it down. Some of your mummy, well, some of your mummies and daddies, definitely some of your grannies and grandas. Any the gran anybody here locally ever go and get water in a well? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, exactly. Those of you who are a wee bit older know exactly what we're talking about here. The bucket gets lowered down into this hole in the ground. And you put it right down, lowering it, lowering it with the rope, and then you bring it back up, and lo and behold, <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that the way it works? No, of course it isn't. You don't bring up bottled water, you just bring up the water that is there from the spring that the well is drawing the water from, and, and you pull it up, and then the, the water's in the bucket and you can use it. And many, many years ago, that's how a lot of people got their water. But here's the question this morning, because Isaiah wrote to the people and he talks about God and he's saying that God has got a well. Isn't that interesting? Not, not the sort that you just bring up water like this to drink, but Isaiah is saying what God does for his people is a bit like a well. Now, if I get some water out of the well, what could I do with it? What's, you've got an idea? Go for it, yes. You could, yes, I'm going to come to that in a wee minute, and I'm maybe thirsty, I could drink it. What's the other thing you do with water? <coughs> wash your face, wash your whole body. You maybe fill the bath with water, you turn the shower on, and you use the water to wash. Well, God says through Isaiah to the people, I have a special type of water. Water to make you clean. Water so that your sin can be forgiven. And so this morning, whenever I think about the well that God's talking about, I'm thinking, yeah, when God gives me his special water, God wants to wash away my sin. We've been singing about it and praying about it. We all know that we do things that are wrong. God says he can wash us away, wash away the sin in our lives so that we can be forgiven and belong to him. But there's a, so you mentioned drinking water. You drink water when you're thirsty. God tells me that whenever I'm thirsty, not just for juice to drink, but when I don't know the way to go in life and I'm a bit confused, God has said, listen, my word, it's like something to eat or drink. You need it every day. You can't do without it. Boys and girls, God's saying to us, listen, water to wash us clean. Jesus has died to forgive us, but you need my word every day. You don't go to the well once and get water and it'll do you for weeks and weeks and weeks. You need to go back and you need to go back and you need to go back. Mums and dads as well as boys and girls, there's no point thinking, we'll come to Jesus once and I'll trust him and then I'll get on with living my life my own way. God says, you've got to keep coming back to me. You've got to keep listening to my word. And here's the last bit and then we're going to put the verse up on the screen. Whenever you're thirsty and you're playing football with your friends and I've seen it at BB in the hall one night and you'll find that the boys maybe should ask the BB leaders, can I go to the kitchen and get a drink? But somebody will just run off into the kitchen and they'll get a drink. And there'll be some other wee boy at BB and he's looking, where did you get that? Now, what should the Draminis boys who know their way around the hall do? What should they tell their friends? Where should they point them? Go for it, Rosie. To the kitchen where the water is. You don't hide it. You say, yeah, look, we've got water. It's in a tap. You can... Run a tap full of water, you can have a drink. Boys and girls, this is the exciting thing about God's special well. He says, come, I'll wash you clean. He says, come, you won't be thirsty. And then he says, go, take the water to other people. It is no good, us being at church at Dreminis, 
and knowing that we've got a, a God who loves us and who forgives us and takes our sin away and who gives us what we need every day and then we keep it a big secret and we don't tell anybody. God says, listen, your job is to carry the water to the rest of Hamilton's Bond and Armagh. Tell other people about Jesus. Here's your challenge for this week. I, I've done this before and I do it again. When somebody asks you what you did at the weekend, you can list I watched a program on TV, I played PlayStation, I played sport at school, I went to see my granny. Be a courageous Dramenis boy or girl and tell some of your friends that you were here because you follow God. You belong to Jesus. You're his disciple. Let other people know about the good news about God. So boys and girls, um, I'm glad I don't have to go and take a well down, a bucket down a well. But I'm so glad that God has given me special water. He washes away my sin. He gives me what I need every day. He tells me to take it to others. Here's the verse that we read. It's going to come up on the screen. And we're going to say it once together. Um, here it is. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Isaiah 12, verse 3. We'll start at the Isaiah 12, verse 3. And we'll say it together after 3. 1, 2, 3. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. It's amazing because this is good news that puts a smile on your face. Not just that you've water to drink, but that you know Jesus as your Savior and you want other people to know too. Boys and girls, thank you so much for, for listening. I am going to do a pulpit survey. and I'm not going to ask for answers just now. In the coming weeks and months, it would be lovely again in the future to be able to have the, the boys and girls up at the front for a children's talk. We haven't got that far yet, obviously. Um, as parents feed into me as we talk as Kirk Session about things that we can do and things that we can't do, um, let, let us know how you feel about that. At the moment, um, children are with their mums and dads at this stage in the service. Used to be that we had a, a gathering at the front. Um, let me know your thoughts on that as, as we, we talk it through uh, as leaders and, and work out our, our roads ahead in all those issues. We're going to sing, boys and girls. We're going to sing, Wonderful Lord, Wonderful God, you're my shield and my protector. Um, and I'm glad to have you helping me with the actions as we stand to sing. take our seats together. So as we pray, uh, I'm going to lead you in prayer before the boys and girls go out to Sunday school. Two or three things to think about as we pray. One, um, let's pray for people that we know who are in trouble, whether that's in hospital or sick at home or, or a problem at work. You know somebody and, and life is not easy for them at the moment. Let's pray for them. The second thing, um, if we pray, can we pray today and pray for somebody you know who doesn't know of or hear of the well of God's good news. Maybe somebody in your school, young people, maybe somebody in your workplace, adults, maybe somebody in your street. And you know, it used to be that everybody in the countryside could have told you the good news of the gospel. We now live in a day and an age where there's lots of people don't hear the good news. Let's pray about people that we know 
um, that God would use us to carry the good news to them. And then the last group of people to pray about, on Friday morning, I had the privilege for an hour of sitting up at the front here with a man called James Farmer, who we have had at church before. And James is a Bible college teacher in a place called Myanmar. And he's teaching his class online at the moment. Um, so he gets up at half past five in the morning to teach his Bible college class in Myanmar. They are under serious political pressure. Um, the, the military coup means that the people who want to do things normally and go to church and worship are, are being put down at the moment. And so James sat at the front here and f we filmed me and James talking about the book of Hebrews that we've gone through recently um, to try and help his Bible college students in Yangon in Myanmar. So we want to pray for them this morning because they're going to have to listen to me this week. Um, and I, I hope that something that, that we've shared of our learning from Hebrews that I've tried to pass on to them might be useful to them. It takes real courage to be a young Christian in Yangon to maybe go to youth fellowship. Here you're not going to get in trouble for going to youth fellowship. Nobody's going to stop you outside and question you why you were here. But in Yangon, if you were a young person or a young adult opening up your Bible, that would happen. So let's pray for these people. Let's do that together as I lead you in prayer. And um, let's join before God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and that the comfort and encouragement it is to us in tough times. And so Lord, every single one of us knows of somebody today who's in difficulty, either with illness and needing the help of the doctors or at home and lonely or discouraged or maybe the problem is at work lord and a worry about money and the future father we come this morning to pray for people in the tough times they're going through that you would help them and protect them and provide for them but lord make us a people who are relying on you more and more we want to do that Father, we pray for people around us in our schools, our colleges, our streets, our workplaces who haven't yet heard the good news of Jesus. We find that hard to believe, but Lord, we know that there are people who are no longer listening, who don't understand this message of your gift, which is free, and your love, which is great, and the reality that one day everyone will meet you as judge or savior. So Lord, help us this week to be urgent and intentional about taking the good news to the people around us and knowing that the seed of your word is powerful to change lives. And so, Lord, we pray for the, the Bible college students in the class in Yangon, in Myanmar. We pray for Dr. Timothy Mang there and his work. We pray for James and Hazel here in Northern Ireland, wishing they were there, but teaching online. Lord, I pray for that gathering of Christian believers that you would equip Bible students, guys and girls, some to preach, some to teach youth groups. Lord, I pray that you would take their lives and as the word of God rests deeply in them, that they would be useful in preaching, teaching, and pointing others to Christ. Lord, thank you for the well of salvation. Thank you for living water. And we pray that today, right around your world, where your word is preached, that your voice would be heard and people would come to know you and trust you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now at this stage, the boys and girls can go out to Sunday school um, and that will be in the hall. So boys and girls at this stage, you can head that direction. And any boys and girls maybe who are visiting, they're allowed to go too if they want. They can stay in, they can go out and you'll get looked out after out there, I promise, um, for Sunday school in the hall. If you want, while we are getting ready, and as the wee ones go out, we're going to be looking at Isaiah 12. You can open it again. Um, there won't be much of a PowerPoint this morning, just three points that will appear on the screen in a minute or two that will take us through this passage. Um, so if you have the Bible open too, you can see where I'm going in what I share. Isaiah, and I suppose this is where I begin to, to resonate a wee bit with Isaiah. Isaiah was a preacher in a time of crisis. The crisis, as I've painted to you in the previous weeks, is that Assyria, which was the superpower of the day, was beginning to encroach on Israel in the north and then eventually Judah. Isaiah is the preacher prophet to Judah. And so in this time of crisis, it's a political crisis. 
It is also a spiritual crisis because Isaiah is warning them and he's saying that just like the nations around you, you have become lazy spiritually. You have pushed God to the margins of your life. And so Isaiah is preaching in a time of crisis. It's a long book, as you know, lots and lots of chapters. Actually, chapter 12 marks the end of the first chunk of Isaiah. And this first chunk of Isaiah is holding intention constantly. The coming judgment of God, so the judgment that would come because the foreign invading power will come and take over your land, and also the judgment of God because of sin. And, and it's held in tension the whole time as you go through these opening chapters with hope on the horizon. So it's not always a dark, bleak picture. There is constantly this picture on the horizon of hope, a God who forgives, a God who is compassionate. Very particularly, the prospect of a coming Messiah. Isaiah couldn't have fully known what God in the fullness of time would do in Jesus Christ. But he knew that there was a hope for the future, even in the face of this terrible day. Can I say a couple of things at, at, at the outset? The, the on that day that you see in, at the beginning of chapter 12, chapter 12, verse 1, in that day you will say, twice in the previous chapter, in verse, sorry, in verse 10 of the previous chapter, and then twice in chapter 12, this little phrase, in that day or on that day, is speaking ahead to the day. On that day, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day when God will intervene decisively in all of history in the coming of his Messiah. And Isaiah is speaking ahead to that day of hope, and he's saying, in that day, on that day, things will change. And so he's preaching in a time of crisis, but he's also conscious that on that day, there will be hope. There will be the beginning of a new kingdom. I find myself as a 21st century preacher in part, standing in Isaiah's shoes. You'd be a long time persuading me that it's not a day of crisis. Some of you might see that crisis in terms of where we are in the Western world and the pushing away of the values that have held us in place. Some of you may see that crisis just within the island we live on politically and where things are going. Some of you may see that crisis in terms of even just food on our tables and health service so you get the operation that you need when you need it. We live like Isaiah in a day of crisis. And so what Isaiah has to say in chapter 12, looking ahead, is as relevant today as it was when he first preached. And it's interesting because despite the, the political climate and the anticipated invasion from Assyria and the prospect of God's judgment, despite all of that, Isaiah preaches a song. A joyous, bubbling over song full of anticipation and rejoicing. Did you see in chapter 12 as we read it? Verse 1, praise. Verse 2, it's a song. Verse 4, thanks and thanksgiving. Verse 5, sing. Verse 6, sing and shout. So, this morning I'm not going to get up on the pulpit. I don't know if Isaiah was a singing prophet. and I'm not going to do that. But I am pointing you to the fact that even in the face of a day of crisis, Isaiah is singing. Isaiah is proclaiming a song regarding the day that is yet to come. And right at the heart of this song of hope against a backdrop of judgment is one picture which I shared with the children, that of a well. Verse 3, with joy you will draw, well, draw water from the wells of salvation. Let me very simply this morning take that phrase and let that open out the whole passage for us. Start from there at the heart of the song and see what Isaiah is saying. Three simple things. One, there is a well of forgiveness. Two, there is a well that runs deep. This is not a, a one drink wonder. And then finally, there's a well from which we carry water to the rest of the world. And you see something in the last verses of the chapter as Isaiah is not only looking ahead to the day of Messiah, but he's looking ahead to the day of Messiah when the good news of the gospel will be carried beyond Israel to the nations. And well, again, while Isaiah, as the preacher prophetically looking ahead, can't understand fully all that that would be, you can sense that, that there's an anticipation 
that a day will come when this will be good news for the nations. Let me take these three things simply this morning and open them out one at a time. First of all, a well of forgiveness and comfort. It's a life or death moment for Judah. Judgment has come. And with it, possibly captivity, possibly even death. And so it's appropriate that the picture that Isaiah uses is one that speaks of life and death. You see, in the Middle East, 2,000 years ago, 2,700 years ago in Isaiah's day, as is the case in our day, water wasn't a, a luxury commodity. I mean, I, I'm standing here in the pulpit this morning. We just have bottles of water lying about. We know there'll be more fall from the sky later probably today. We turn a tap on, there's water. In the Middle East, you, do, you, do, you don't have that luxury. You didn't then and you don't today. Water was a matter of life and death. Dry and weary land, as the psalmist wrote, where there is no water. A well was not a luxury. A well was a source of life rather than the inevitability of death if you don't get to water. And so Isaiah is speaking of a coming day when, I, when the Messiah will come and it will be a matter, and this is the first thing, and this is critically important, it will be a matter of life or death. It'll be forgiveness and cleansing or judgment. Look at the, the verse, verse one, because it's possibly as succinct a summary of the gospel as you're going to find anywhere in scripture. This, the writer Isaiah says, I will praise you, Lord, because although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. When you journey your way through the Bible, when you endeavor to preach God's word in the 21st century, you discover that there are some things that you cannot tiptoe round and sidestep. And one of them is the righteous anger of a holy God against sin, which has spoiled and ruined his perfect world. For God not to have that holy righteous anger against sin is for him to cease to be God. As my children say, to use the modern parlance, it is what it is. You, you can't set this aside and try and have a Christianity that avoids this. Couldn't in Isaiah's day and you can't in our day. God is rightly angry because of the damage that sin does. Four times in the, the, the previous chapters, in fact five, there's a verse that recurs, and I didn't see it in my preparation over the first 11, 12 chapters, a, phrase, a, a verse that is used repeatedly in chapter 5, verse 25, 9, chapter 9, verse 12, 19 and 21, and then chapter 10, verse 4, where, the, where Isaiah says, for all this, his anger is not turned away, and his hand is still raised. Now, without being politically incorrect, what do you think the image is of the father with the hand raised? Yes, it's the, the prospect of a smack. That, that there's, there's judgment coming because of sin, that the hand of God raised in righteous anger because sin not only offends his perf perfect holiness, but it also spoils his perfect world. And so God can't overlook sin. Your sin, my sin, anybody's sin. And yet, Isaiah writes and he says this, your anger, you've been angry with me, rightly, because I'm a sinner, but your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Now, here is what is utterly critical to understanding the gospel or you don't get the gospel. Whenever you read that God's anger has been turned away, what sort of understanding or thought is in your mind? Because I know that as a father, sometimes I would turn away my anger or crossness and I'll go, I'll just pretend not to see what has been done wrong. And I'll maybe walk away and let's be honest, I'll maybe occasionally leave it and think, well, Karen will discover that later and she can sort that out with the offender. There's a few dads do that. That is not the sort of turning away that Isaiah is writing about where you turn a blind eye and turn away. No, what Isaiah is saying is more like this. How many of you watch or follow um, news on the other side of the Atlantic? If you're watching American TV and news, one of the things that happens in the autumn time is there are constantly hurricane news warnings and updates. So on this east coast uh, and the, the hurricanes and storms roll in and you see them and they track 
where it's spinning. And they'll say, yeah, it's going to hit this city, uh, but it's going to miss that one. And then at the last minute, you see it's coming in, and there are folk in a particular city, and they go, the storm just seems to have turned away. And instead of going through our city, it's actually going to hit further down the coast, and it has turned, and it has gone that way instead. That's the image you need in mind as you think about God's anger with sin. The storm of God's righteous anger against sin turns away from where it should land on you and me. And it's visited upon God's sinless son who was pierced for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, as Isaiah will later write in Isaiah 53. God turning his wrath away is not God deciding not to judge sin. It's God steering the storm of his righteous anger. And instead of it plowing over me, it's laid on his son on the cross. Now that's the gospel. That's why Isaiah can say, you were angry with me, with us. Not knowing what is yet to come, Isaiah is able to, to say, Lord, your anger will be turned away. And in that I will be comforted. Well, that's the, the glorious good news this morning for us as Christians. In Christ, our sins have been paid for. That's why this morning, if we're sitting here as believers who know that our lives aren't what they should be, and we know of the sin that's maybe as yet unconfessed, we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, I know that the only place of forgiveness and comfort will be turning again to Christ and coming to the well of salvation and saying, Lord, thank you that the storm of your righteous anger, instead of coming upon me is laid upon Christ. This book, this Bible, is a one-story book. The well of salvation has not yet run dry. The water of cleansing and forgiveness is still offered in Jesus Christ. Come thirsty. There's life rather than death. There's comfort and peace in the gospel. This is my testimony, as it's the story of many who've gone before me, and God willing will come after me. You were angry with me, Lord. But through Christ, your anger has been dealt with at the cross, turned away, and I now live in the comfort of your forgiveness. It's a wonderful place to be. And this morning, God, in his word, is offering that again to us. There is a well, <clears throat> a well of forgiveness, a well of salvation. Have you been there? Only you know. But you need to go there. Let me move on. Second thing is that this whole story of God's word is not that you have one drink from this well of salvation. And then you say, well, that's that done and dealt with, and now I'll get on with living the rest of my life. You know, I, I've said this time and time again in the pulpit. One of my frustrations about Northern Irish Christianity is sometimes the presentation of the gospel in such a way that implies that you put your trust in Christ, you say a prayer, that's it, done and dusted, that's your name transferred from this book into that book, and now essentially you can toddle along as you please from here on. There is no such gospel, either in God's good purposes for how we would live representing him in the world, or for our good as we stay with Christ and persevere. See what the, the, the psalmist sorry, the, the Isaiah writes about the Lord in verse 2. He says, surely God is my salvation. The Lord is my strength, my strong. He has become my salvation. It is present tense. He's not saying at the wee meeting in 1978, I said a prayer and I, he's saying, no, listen, the Lord is my salvation. To know him, to know him daily, to follow him, to trust him, to drink deeply from his provision his salvation. This is my life. This is my strength. This is my soul. Christians come to understand that my salvation is past, present, and future. My sins have been forgiven. My salvation is present while I walk with God, knowing his grace daily and living in dependence upon him. And someday it will be in fullness that I'll be freed from not only sin's power and the penalty that I deserve, but from, even from the presence of sin, but that day lies up ahead. For now, I'm still walking, knowing that this is a constant, never-flowing supply. Christians say, yes, I was saved. 
such and such a date when I put my trust in Christ. I am being saved, and someday, finally, I will be safe and saved forever. Do you remember the lady at the well? And she came looking to have a conversation with Jesus about something to drink. And Jesus says to her, look, let's get a drink of water from the well. And the lady starts talking about the well, and then eventually Jesus says to her, listen, I've got a drink for you that is different. And they have a conversation, and eventually it comes out into the open that her life's a bit mixed up, and there's all sorts going on. Jesus says to her, listen, I will give you a drink that wells up onto eternal life. Not just a wee sip that will deal with the past, cover it over, but I'm going to give you something that is so satisfying and so, so, so fulfilling that you will come back and you will drink from this well of salvation the rest of your days until you meet the Lord. Maybe some of us this morning, and we can say, yes, there was a day that I became a Christian. I went to the well, I understood my need, I asked for forgiveness, but the honest reality of my life is it's a bit mundane and dry spiritually. And yeah, go to church. But I can't really say that this is where my longing lies. The Lord calls you to come today to see the gospel and to see Christ, not as just your fix so that you don't go to hell, but as your filling daily so that you come to the Lord and say, I need your word. I'm thirsty for this. I need to know you. I need to walk with you daily to realize there's a depth to this. Um, in Ephesians, Paul writes, you would know how wide and high and long and deep is the love of God in Christ. It's something that you need daily. The, the writer, Isaiah, goes on, he says, the, the Lord, the Lord, he repeats it. It's, it's all about him, it's not about me. He is my strength, he is my song. I'm weak, but I'm strong when I'm trusting in him. With joy, I go to the wells of salvation. This is my delight in life. Not, yes, there are other things that are a, a joy and a pleasure, but the psalmist is saying, literally, this is the thing that is my joy. So I call him the psalmist. It's Isaiah not the psalmist. I, Isaiah is saying, that this is my joy. This is my delight. And I'm asking myself, as I say to you this morning, as you speak of life and the stuff that you do and the stuff that you enjoy, what do you say is your joy and your delight? Your family, your toys, your activities? Or can you say, yeah, I've come to know the one who has provided for me in the well of salvation. And it is just my joy to keep going back to the well, to keep opening up God's word, to share in fellowship with other believers, to learn to pray. I was thrilled during the week to talk to a young mum who said, Sam, I don't want to just say my bedtime prayers. God bless Granny, God bless Granda, God bless whoever. She said, I, I want to learn to pray because I want to talk to this God who loves me and has saved me. I want to get to know him better. Isaiah is saying, with joy we go to the well. Not just a gritted teeth slog, but running on with a smile. And as Isaiah says, calling on his name, praying. This is not just one off that I've said the prayer and that's me done and dusted, but that I come to the well that runs deep and I drink daily. And I say, Lord, I want to know more of you, which takes me to the last thing. Drink from the well of forgiveness. Discover the depth and the sufficiency of the flow. And then finally this, when you find something good, what do you do? It's what I said about the boys in the kitchen and knowing there's a tap, great, we're all sweating, give us the water. I've told you before about my favorite beach. I'll tell you briefly about it again. Boyater Bay, also known as the murder hole in Melmore and Donegal. 20 years ago, in fact, 25 years ago, when I first went to that beach, when I say there wasn't a soul on it, I mean, I'm not talking here, Port Stewart Strand, on a cold day when there's half a dozen or 10 people. I'm talking nobody. I mean, literally nobody. But about six, seven years ago, this little beach that you have to go across a cow field and over a sand dune and down the other side, and you've got to drive about 15 minutes through a track lane to get out to the end of the peninsula before you even go through the cow field and the sand dunes and get to the beach. About 10, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, people began to discover it, more people were going. And then, both the Irish Times and I think the English Times included this in the top 100 places in the world to see before you die. 
And the word is getting out about this beach. And people are traveling from all over. This summer, there are so many people who have heard the news of the beach at the murder hole at Boyder Bay that the roadway from miles out says no access to murder hole, no access to Boyder Bay. There are ropes along the side of the ditch where people were trying to park. They've, they've, they're trying to turn everybody away now because the word has got out about the good news. Word of mouth. I've told some of you and some of you have gone. It's appeared in the paper. And I was going, I like the look of that. Drone footage is shown. And everybody says, yeah, we've got to go see this. Isn't it sobering as Christians, and maybe even disturbing to our souls, that we share the good news of a lovely beach or a nice place you've been for a meal, and yet we're slow to share this wonderful, not only life-changing, but life-or-death news of a well where there's forgiveness and satisfaction. This is a, good, a day of good news. We're not to keep it to ourselves. On that day, Isaiah says, a gospel era will begin when those who come to the well will be water carriers to the rest of the world. Don't say that it's just a personal matter. It's not for the whole of humanity, for each soul in Hamilton's Bourne, for each person in your extended family. This is life or death. This is heaven or hell. This is eternity with God or separated from God. And we have this good news, treasure in, char in jars of clay. And God says, listen, it's your water to share. Make known among the nations what he has done, Isaiah says, that all the nations would hear. This is why mission matters. What do you do? You proclaim that his name is exalted. You announce who God is, the most high one, that there's no one like him. I know the king. I know the truth. Do you know him? Let me introduce you. I'm um, thrilled to, to hear that the pastor of the church that Hannah's going to today is a guy who has been so determined over the years to find people in his congregation that he can point clearly to Jesus. That there's a, there's a guy called Barry Cooper. We've watched him on Christianity Explorer, Discipleship Explorer. And this minister, he, he said, no, look, there's a guy in my congregation. I want to talk to him about Jesus. I want to point him to the water. I want to open up the Bible with him. With an urgency to carry the water to others. Not with timidity, but with boldness. Not with glumness, but with gladness. To sing and to shout for joy that we've found the water. And we want others to share in it too. And Isaiah finishes in chapter 12 by saying, Sing, shout for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel. Where? In heaven? Yes. But more than that, great is the Holy One of Israel among you. And just as God by His Spirit has been with His people in all the ages and will be in all the ages through to Christ's return and when we're gathered together, even this morning, God's gift to his people is that by his spirit he is among us people this morning the well contains the drink that you need the water of life the water of forgiveness can i challenge you as i challenge my own soul don't just come for one sip so that your sins are forgiven come and drink deeply drink daily and when you've realized how good it is, take the water to the world around you. And who knows, but that your witness will be part of what God uses. That someone else would come to know the one who is the water of life. Let's pray. Lord, like Isaiah, we find ourselves... In strange days, we wouldn't deny that. And yet, Lord, I thank you that even in Isaiah's day, the, the, the message, the song of hopefulness, of forgiveness, of Messiah coming was echoing out through Isaiah's preaching. Lord, we pray that the, the echo would go from this place this morning of one who washes clean, one who has averted his righteous anger onto your son so that we might be forgiven. 
And Lord, I pray for the people of Terminus that we would thirst deeply for you, that we would drink deeply from the well, from your word, and sharing and fellowship with each other. And that you'd equip us to carry the water to others. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now we're going to finish um, this morning as we, we sing together. We're going to stand as we sing the piece that the, the choir sang for us on Harvest Sunday two weeks ago. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient all knowing, he counts not their sum. Um, his mercy is more. Let's stand as we sing this together. how we thank you that faced with the reality of our sins being many and we're all in that camp this morning we thank you that in Christ your mercy is more your grace is sufficient and you're willing to throw the record of our wrongs into a sea without bottom or shore father we know it's a debt we can't pay and so we come to Christ this morning thank you that the offer of the gospel is held out before us today today is the day of salvation and lord i pray that many would hear taste and see that god is good and so now may the grace of the lord jesus the love of god and the fellowship of the spirit rest upon us now and forevermore